welcome to everyone who's uh, joining us in person and welcome as well to all those who are joining us online. Uh, it's uh, our great privilege to welcome somebody who's been a pioneering leader through her whole uh, career. Uh, just an impressive uh, record of accomplishment, a person who has, has transcended as it were, who's managed to go uh, from being a leader in academia to implementing policy at the very highest level and at a standard internationally that really is an envy of the world. Uh, and so we're very pleased that she's uh, taken the time to join us. Uh, we've She's been all over this morning. So this is a one stop along the way. Uh, and so we're so pleased that she's here. And we really hope that this is uh, really the beginning of a relationship uh, with, with the school. So I'm Audrey Laporte. I'm the director of IHPME. Uh, and uh, so I want to uh, welcome you personally as, as well. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a, a snapshot of the bio, uh, just because I think it's it's important to just kind of lay out um, the span. I will give you a taste uh, so that you have the context that informs the training, the expertise that that she has brought to bear to uh, you know move policy forward, as she'll be sharing with, with us today. Uh, Professor Sophia Chan is currently professor in nursing and senior advisor to the president's office at the University of Hong Kong. Professor Chan was appointed by the HKSAR government to be undersecretary for food and health from 2012 to 2017 and secretary for food and health from 2017 to 2022. She was the first nurse in Hong Kong appointed in this ministerial position. She has led the food and health um, uh, in making remarkable contributions in the formulation and implementation of various major policies in health, food, and environmental hygiene, such as primary health care development, as well as the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. So I wasn't joking when I said she's done <laughs> an awful lot. Uh, during her tenure as SFH, she has made exemplary efforts and undertaken policy initiatives in protecting and promoting the health of the population through major policy initiatives, such as embarking on a new journey in primary health care by developing district health centers in each district in Hong Kong, developing the first Chinese medicine hospital, opening the first children's hospital, and launching the Hong Kong Cancer Strategy in 2019. And on top of all that, <laughs> banning e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products in Hong Kong. Before the government appointment, Professor Chen was the head of Department of Nursing Studies in the School of Nursing of HKU from 2002 to 11, and an assistant dean of the Li ka -shing Faculty of Medicine of HKU from 20, 2001 to 12. She was trained in and uh, practiced general and pediatric nursing in Hong Kong and London. She got her master's of education from the University of Manchester, master's of public health from Harvard, and her doctor of philosophy from the University of Hong Kong. With that, I welcome mm -hmm. you once again, Dr. Chen, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Audrey, for your very kind, uh, generous uh, introduction. Um, uh, it's indeed my great honor and pleasure, and thank you for hosting and thank uh, Xiaolin uh, and your dean for uh, um, sort of hosting me and also uh, providing me this opportunity to share with you uh, in person. And also I understand there is um, a number of people also uh, um, now on, uh, uh, on the web uh, to, uh, to share this work that is very dear to my heart. Uh, as I think Audrey has, uh, earlier introduced. Uh, during my uh, 10 years in government, I've done a lot uh, in health policy, but primary health care, well, the reason why I've chosen this is indeed very dear to my heart. It's something, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this journey. Uh, so that's why, you know, having uh, this reform, I would say reform is something that I want to share with you. Um, I must say, uh, I have not included a lot about my own research. Uh, here because um, that is something I want to illustrate in uh, policy. Uh, but my area of research is in tobacco control, you know, smoking cessation. 
uh, and I happen to also, with all the statistics, sneak in two slides to tell you a little bit about uh, smoking in Hong Kong. All right, so uh, my pleasure and honor indeed. Thank you. Uh, so just these uh, acknowledgements, and I would also like to acknowledge uh, Audrey as well, you know, with, with your uh, unit. And uh, Xiaolin actually explained to me, you know, the, the different units you know, in the school. Uh, so what I will talk about is, uh, first of all, you know, uh, primary health care is actually not something new. It is something that has started uh, many, many years ago. Uh, you know, Hong Kong, what Hong Kong has done and um, what I have done during my term uh, as a health minister, I, I would like to share. And um, so uh, one of the things that I've done is to have set up district health centers uh, in the um, all the 18 districts in Hong Kong, as well as uh, draw up a primary health care blueprint for the development uh, of primary health care in Hong Kong. So then I, I thought, you know, what's the some of the key issues that uh, what's next, you know, what what should um, the government or us, you know, focus on. And finally, to talk a little bit about this new centre that I have set up after I'm back to the university. Uh, I'm now back uh, about a year, you know, to the University of Hong Kong. I was on actually on no pay leave. <laughs> Where, to the government. Originally five years and then later another five years. Okay, so the reason why I said it's not new is in 19, the party didn't go actually. <laughs> um, but anyway, in 1978, uh, actually, this declaration of Elmo Arthur, uh, you know, WHO has already had this report on primary health care and they call on member states uh, that it is essential care and university accessible. And the main focus is really going back to the people that we we really should be taking care of ourselves in uh, in primary health care as well and that it urge all government to do that now um okay so later you know who have another report um in 2008 uh, and then, you know, again, uh, you know, uh, urging the, uh, the, the member states, the government uh, to improve their response capacity and also uh, health systems globally to drift, uh, you know, from one short term priority to another, because they observe that actually people are not doing a lot of reform. They just, you know, touch on things. So therefore, uh, they set and yet another, you know, report. Well, another uh, 78, another 40 years, then they uh, recently, most recently, have a, another global conference as, at uh, Astana to renew the commitment of primary health care again, you know, to uh, urge, you know, government and especially in the context of uh, sustainable development goals, uh, linking primary health care, universal health coverage, and also uh, the uh, SDG and also social determinants of health around the world uh, to, you know, primary health care. So, you know, this is 40 years on. So um, I got from the website, this is about Canada. Um, so um, the DFCM uh, and also Ontario Health, uh, Toronto um, have this new partnership to support primary health care integration into the health system, uh, in particular on those few areas, COVID recovery, attachment to primary care, you know, human resources, and also uh, primary care engagement. And that's uh, really uh, impressive. Um, uh, this is uh, another uh, thing I find from the website. Uh, again, you know, this is something that uh, the University of Toronto, your School of Public Health, is establishing uh, with the Northwest Healthcare uh, Properties uh, network, um, uh, you know, on collaboration uh, on this Institute of uh, Pandemics uh, and, you know, some other work that is related to uh, primary care. And this is another uh, primary care providers getting new tool for social risk factors during COVID-19. So this shows that this is not only Hong Kong, but actually global and uh, in the context of your university as well. So if we look at Hong Kong, um, 
what have Hong Kong done? You know, after all those WHO reports, these are all the reports that Hong Kong has uh, published. Uh, this one, uh, very uh, instrumental, called Health for All, The Way Ahead, uh, report of the Working Party on Private Health Care. So that was in response to the Elmer Arter uh, Declaration. And then we have all these reports, you know, in Hong Kong is basically about healthcare financing, you know, not, not about primary health care until 2010. You know, there was this primary care development in Hong Kong, a strategy document, a primary care directory that was published. This is also in the term of government before I joined government. So these were before that. Uh, during my term, I completed the blueprint, the primary health care blueprint, and we have also uh, issued, uh, this is on NCD prevention, uh, uh, a, a, again, you know, a document, uh, an action plan uh, that worked towards and is related to primary, uh, primary care. So these are some of the documents that we have done. But then, you know, in terms of um, the, the real strategy, it has never had a sort of like a reform. So my journey, uh, this is when I studied my master's degree over, over 30 years ago. And at the time, actually, uh, this is my master's thesis. So at the time, this report was published uh, in Hong Kong. And so my master's thesis is, oops, is to uh, reorient the basic nursing curriculum, because at the time, I'm a nurse teacher, uh, to primary health care in Hong Kong you know, the way ahead. So that's my master thesis. And more importantly, not only me, but if you look at this secretary, principal assistant secretary for health and welfare. So this is a government report uh, chaired by Professor Rosie Young. Uh, her name is not here, but uh, she's the chair of this uh, report. And this government secretary was actually the chief executive during my term. So she was very adamant about doing primary health care because uh, 30 years ago, she actually uh, wrote this report, uh, you know, together with this working group. And uh, so very, very happy when she asked me to become the minister, she actually said she wanted to do primary health care. And I was so happy, you know, that she wanted a chief executive because if she wanted to do it, she would give resources. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, and uh, very few um, chief executives want to do primary health care because it's not easy to see the results. You know, they want to build hospitals because that's more visible. So that's my uh, journey. So um, there are a lot of key recommendations. And um, of course, strong emphasis towards primary health care in policy making as well as services uh, and uh, greater participation by the community and also the healthcare professionals and individuals. So that's how it was started, you know, over 30 years ago. So you, I, I thought we need to understand a little bit about the healthcare system in Hong Kong uh, to put in context. So Hong Kong has a, um, a heavily subsidized public healthcare system uh, with 90% uh, of um, public money uh, or usage uh, on secondary and tertiary care. So this is small hospital and only about 32% on outpatient. So this is public, all public money. Private, that is self-financed by the patients. Um, we have, we have uh, about 40, 43 public hospitals in Hong Kong and 13 private hospitals. So only 10% of people use private because it's all out of pocket. Uh, but then in primary care, is the other way around. So the government put in very few resources, only about 30%, and 70% outpatient is actually out of pocket. So it's uh, actually private. So we call it a twin track system, but it is actually uh, in terms of government subsidy is all on secondary and tertiary care. So I thought I the two slides I want to sneak in on uh, smoking. Uh, in Hong Kong. So while we are on statistics, Hong Kong enjoyed a uh, very low smoking prevalence with all the hard work that we have put in. 
not only by uh, the government, but also by academics and also all the healthcare professionals, all the way from 23% in 1982 uh, to single digit, just uh, uh, I announced it last year. So in uh, 9.5. So uh, with all the multi pronged approach um, that uh, we have put in, and uh, I think in Hong Kong, now that we are in a very low smoking prevalence, and with this report, uh, NCD prevention, we have announced that uh, by 2025, we want it to further down to 7.8%. Uh, but of course, personally, I, I think it is very hard. It's very difficult now that we are so low uh, to further push another 2% unless we have, we increase tobacco tax, you know, uh, in a big way, otherwise it's, it's going to be difficult. But then nevertheless, this is our target. So um, I think we can embark on a tobacco end game. And uh, you know, uh, during the time when I was minister, I actually announced these four strategies. Uh, I, I, I can see actually uh, there is sustainability of policy in this term of government. Uh, they are going to have a public consultation uh, you know, very, very soon. Uh, you know, when, when the government push out uh, public consultation, that is something they will really want to do, uh, you know, in a big way. So uh, that's why they do the public consultation. Uh, so, of course, you know, the two directions is one is to really preventing people, especially young people from becoming smokers. And second is, of course, to cut down, you know, the smoking prevalence that is to promote smoking cessation among people who are, you know, smokers now. So with these two, two directions, uh, we, uh, I have suggested these four strategies. I'm sure this term of government may have even more innovative uh, strategy as well. So then coming back to the uh, two major challenges, why we really uh, need to do primary health care, you know, here and now, is the demographic challenges, uh, aging population, chronic disease challenges, growth, growing burden, and also complexity of our um, uh, 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 chronic diseases. And of course, these two would lead to public expenditure challenge, given we have such a heavily subsidized uh, public uh, health care system. So these are the uh, projected um, uh, life expectancy, you know, men is 87, women 93. And uh, so the government is uh, subventions to the hospital authority, HA is hospital authority, is over 113% increase, you know, in the last you know, 10 years. So we have poured in money to the secondary and tertiary system. But is this sustainable? We don't think it is sustainable. If we look at, uh, in a nutshell, aging population. So by uh, 2021, we have about 1.5 million you know, people who are age 65 uh, and over, about 20%. Uh, by 2039, the projection is it will increase to 31%, 2.5 million about. Chronic disease, well, 2021, we have 2.2 million people who have chronic disease. And by 2030, 39, you know, there would be 3 million. So it's huge. Uh, and the burden, of course, if we look at uh, this one, uh, you know, aging, popu uh, aging population uh, with about one third of people, uh, you know, being uh, elderly people. And uh, this is the uh, aging population, 65 or above is the green color. So it is increasing. Uh, and uh, by age group, if we look at the um, green line that is 65 and above, again, it is increasing. And the, the impact of increasing is that is utilization of healthcare services. Uh, again, uh, this is not the latest data, but I'm sure it is uh, similar. So this is the uh, hospital authority data. Uh, in, this is inpatient service utilization. If we look at uh, people who are 65 or above, the usage of the total patient days, bed days, is increasing exponentially. So with such a heavily subsidized public uh, hospital system, obviously um, it, it hurts the government uh, in terms of our resources. 
the growing burden and complexity of chronic diseases, if we look at, you know, cancer and other uh, chronic diseases, most of them, you know, are increasing. And the projection is that by 2039, it will increase to 3, uh, 3 million. And the higher is your age, the more is the red is, you know, the, the patient ratio who have chronically uh, ill ill people. So the higher your age, the more uh, that you have, you know, chronic diseases. You know, similarly, if you are younger, then, you know, very, the, the percentage um, is less. Um, so not only are people having one uh, chronic disease, people are having uh, comorbidities. So again, if you look at this, this bar, the the, the, the light blue is one to two chronic disease. The red is at least three types of chronic diseases. So as people ages, uh, they have more chronic diseases. And again, you know, this is, they po this uh, pose a lot of burden, you know, for example, the example, uh, diabetes, hypertension, uh, again, you know, with an increase uh, with people with more than uh, one disease, one chronic disease. Uh, and another phenomenon that we have observed, but I, I didn't have a graph to show here, is that people have chronic disease at a younger age, younger and younger. Uh, so, you know, with this, you know, public uh, expenditure challenge, the cost of running public hospital system is uh, exponentially high and it is not sustainable. So, you know, this is the, the inverted triangle situation that is actually very famous in public health. So while the current situation, uh, the government put in a lot of resources on tertiary care, secondary care, and less on primary care and public health promotion. But then, you know, there are more people who need, you know, public health promotion, primary care, you know, than, you know, tertiary care and secondary care. So really we should be, you know, inverting, you know, and going through this desired, you know, situation. So uh, when I was a minister, you know, as the secretary for food and health, um, as, you know, the chief executive is highly supportive. So we have a very strong and clear, you know, um, mandate uh, and also commitment on primary health care. So that was, uh, the, this blue color is the, um, uh, chief Executive Policy Address, and we, we launch it, uh, the different ministers, you know, this is the Minister of Health, Minister of uh, Labour and Welfare, uh, Minister of uh, Public uh, public uh, Affairs. Uh, and so uh, the government, you know, we, we said we're going to step up uh, efforts to promote individual and community involvement, enhance coordination among the different medical and social sectors, and also district um, level primary health care services. At the time, we already said we want to set up a district health uh, centre uh, in with a brand new operation mode in this Kwaiching district with, within two years. That was very, very ambitious, of course, and um, also enhancing uh, public awareness of disease, pre disease, disease prevention. And we'll also make use of this local network to procure services from organizations because in order to do it within two years, you can't get the government to do it. You, you must, you know, ask help from outside. So we actually tender, you know, this operation to the uh, NGOs, you know, to run these uh, centers. So we will also progressively set up district health centers in other districts. So Hong Kong have 18 districts and we started with one and we completed all 18 districts within uh, my term of government, which is five years. So I have uh, three mandates at the time. So one is to set up a steering committee on primary healthcare development, which I personally chair uh, with all the different academics, the practitioners uh, from different disciplines. Um, we also want to develop district health center uh, network in all 18 districts of Hong Kong. And finally, the third mandate is to complete a blueprint for development of primary health care services in Hong Kong. So these are the basic principles, uh, community-based medical social collaboration and public-private uh, collaboration. So this is the milestone of, uh, you know, 2017 to 2022.
uh, initially, we this is the chief executive, Mrs. Carrie Lam. So she announced her first uh, policy address, already have a, a, a lot of input on primary health care. And so I set up this uh, committee in the same year. And then we also set up a uh, primary health care office under the Food and Health Bureau, that is uh, the ministry. And then in 2019, in September, we opened the first uh, district health center in Kwaicheng District. Uh, but poor thing, you know, two months after COVID hit us, you know, after with the opening of the center. But then we never stop our work. So in uh, mainly 2021 and 2022, we opened all the district health centers and district health centers express. So we have seven district health centers and 11 express. So express is a smaller version, uh, but then, you know, we want 18 districts to all have DHC or DHCEs. Uh, in uh, June, which is the last month of my term, well, together with the chief executive, we'll actually launch, you know, this uh, new journey in primary health care. And we have a, a, a ceremony. Um, so this is this is where we, we this is the director of the Department of Health and uh, chairman of the hospital authority. You know, this is my permanent secretary, myself, and also the chief executive. So she, uh, you know, really, you know, took personal attention, you know, in, you know, taking forward primary health care. So very happy to see sustainable development in this term of government. Uh, the chief executive policy address, uh, which was launched uh, last October, uh, they already, uh, said they will publish this blueprint, which was uh, prepared uh, in the last term of government. We didn't launch the blueprint because uh, the chief executive suggested that we should not launch the blueprint at, at the last month of our term in such a big policy uh, initiative. And uh, if it's launched by the next term of government, you know, uh, then they will have more ownership. Um, established the primary health care authority which is to oversee all the development of primary health care in hong kong uh, these are co-care scheme and also uh, you know use of the elderly health care voucher scheme uh, this is not new but then there are new ways of using it uh, in, a, in the context of primary health care you know this is something that we have pilot you know during my term of government and they uh, this term of government is going to launch it you know all over you know, Hong Kong. So it is basically a co-pay co system because we don't have an insurance system. So therefore, how can we incentivize the 70% of people who are paying now out of pocket in primary care to actually sort of uh, engage with family doctor and go to our district health centers and all that. So this is, you know, one of the ways, uh, you know, to do it. So these are the 18 districts in Hong Kong with all the uh, di district health centers or district health centers express. If you look at most of them, except this one in 2019, were actually uh, established in 2021 and 2022. So what are the district health centers? The district health center is basically, you know, now we have you know, one in all, one or one network in all 18 districts, uh, a service hub, and do three levels of prevention, uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And we target three groups of people. First, health promotion for people who are well. Uh, second, for people who are high risk, you know, we have disease prevention and screening. And third, for people who are already sick, but then they are in the community. So chronic disease management, as well as community rehabilitation. The goal is, of course, you know, to enhance the public health status of everybody in Hong Kong, as well as to relieve the secondary and tertiary system, because we have such a long waiting time in our specialist outpatient clinics. People just use the accident and emergency department as the first point of contact because it is highly subsidized. That, that's the whole reason. And uh, the key features uh, at a time, it is community-based services, uh, district-based services, uh, based on the district and also, uh, you know, trying to have a public private partnership. So not only using the public services, but also uh, try to involve the private as well. So each district health center have uh, all these uh, core team members who are registered healthcare professionals, uh, nurses, uh, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, dietitian, pharmacists, 
uh, social worker. Uh, and the, the executive director can be, you know, any any one of these professions. We didn't actually specify. It can be a doctor as well. Uh, but most centers actually have social worker or, or nurses uh, as an executive director. Uh, of course, you know, um, coordination, you know, the district health centers also have a role in coordinating the district-based uh, or community-based healthcare system services, especially in this new context of building a system of primary health care and also the case manager to also support the network doctors, the primary health care doctors. So there is no doctor in the center, but there are uh, we we engage doctors who have their own private uh, clinics uh, in, in the community as our uh, network doctors. So the scope of service, as I've said earlier, is primary, secondary and tertiary prevention, where in primary prevention, is more you know health education including like diet exercise mental health smoking cessation uh secondary prevention is you know high risk factors uh, health risk factors assessment uh, for example we focus on dm and also hypertension screening in particular and for tertiary is is more oops um, is more uh health coaching patient empowerment and also risk uh, assessment and complication screening. So these are some of the examples of uh, health promotion assessment, chronic disease management, and community rehabilitation. Basically, the three levels of uh, prevention work. Um, okay, third mandate, primary healthcare blueprint. So the blueprint aims to actually address the software and also the system aspect of our primary, of our healthcare system. Uh, obviously, we want to improve the health of the population, provide continuous healthcare services and create a sustainable system. Five proposed area of the network, if you look at all the five areas, then you, you won't see you know, any sort of specific programs, but all these are policy tools that uh, we have put in the uh, healthcare reform blueprint that we think the government you know, must continue to do it. Like establish a system, strengthening governance uh, by, you know, I, I will talk a little bit more, you know, each one of them, uh, putting in resources, reinforcing training, you know, more primary healthcare manpower, healthcare professionals. And this is very, very important is to Im improve the data connectivity and also health surveillance. You know, given you know we have created an electronic health uh, record system in the hospitals, uh, but then it is all over the place in primary health care. So we can never link them. So uh, the government is uh, adamant about linking all these uh, data together. So the first one is to develop a system. So we want to have a primary health care system, and that's why we want a, uh, a primary health care uh, authority. Um, so basically, it is now very fragmented. So therefore, we want to uh, develop a uh, a district based health, family oriented community health system based on the DHC model, where we have the district health centers. Uh, we also want to migrate these uh, primary health care service under the district. Department of Health. So we want to consolidate all these services under the Department of Health, the hospital authority, to put it all under one roof. Um, it's big surgery, but uh, it's going to happen. Um, the government is also introducing this uh, chronic disease co-care scheme, as well as repositioning uh, the general outpatient clinics of the hospital authority uh, to also uh, prioritize their chronic disease management. Um, to target more socially disadvantaged population. Nowadays, everybody can use it as a very, very, you know, low cost. Uh, and uh, but then, you know, sometimes you got, can't get an appointment. So um, our thought is, you know, given this uh, new new way of doing it, we want to just target the socially disadvantaged population because this is more government. The thirty percent. The government subsidized and then you know for the normal public is going to be in engaged in this co care scheme second is governance so we want to establish a uh, primary health care authority now they they decided to call it commission uh so uh 
evolving this primary health care office under the uh, bureau. Now it's a health bureau. Uh, previously, we have a food branch as well. So it's food and health bureau, you know, during my, my term. Um, into this primary health care commission, and we have now uh, appointed a commissioner. So we want uh, all the family doctors uh, to enlist in the uh, uh, in the in the primary health care regist registry as well as to use this primary reference uh, framework. Now the directory uh, that is the registry as well as the primary health care framework was actually created in the term of government before my term. And uh, so these are again policy tools. So uh, also to establish two-way referral system between primary health care services, as well as uh, private and, and public and hospital authority. So this is just to so show you uh, some protocol-driven care used in the district health centers in uh, uh, on uh, hypertension, as well as on uh, the, um, diabetes. Resources, most important, um, that uh, if we don't have resources, uh, but where would the resources come, you know, in terms of the, in addition, uh, the money in addition to the existing. So we thought we, we need to use existing. This is the co-care scheme. So people and government are paying together. Uh, this is the existing elderly healthcare voucher. We want to have a different use to gear people towards using more on primary healthcare rather than just episodic. So improve this elderly health voucher scheme, co-payment scheme and also establish a strategic purchasing office to actually oversee the development of uh, uh, strategic pur purchasing programs at the primary care level. Uh, because um, in the last two term of government, the government actually have already given 100 million uh, for a private public partnership. So that was never you know, put into very good use, is used by the hospital authority to actually um, purchase um, areas of work, uh, of care that have very long waiting time. But then they didn't use it um, uh, a lot because if the private market is very vibrant, then there will be a lot of public doctors going into the private market. So if they want to really gauge and not have the uh, private market too vibrant, if the government is doing a lot of, for example, um, radiological investigations, then all the radiologists will go to the private because it's, you know, a lot of money. So that's why uh, uh, now we have set up this uh, strategic purchasing office to oversee this whole development. Manpower, of course, is very, very important. I mean, you know, all of us, you know, as healthcare professionals were trained uh, in uh, a very secondary and tertiary system centric you know, way. So we we never have any clinical practice in primary care settings. So we have to reorient, you know, the curriculum, uh, undergraduate, postgraduate, and also continue a professional uh, education and also involve, you know, all the other healthcare professionals in addition to um, medical doctors, because, you know, in primary care, that's a lot of other practitioners uh, would have a uh, even um, more uh, uh, more important role. Finally, uh, in the blueprint, it also sets data connectivity and also health surveillance. So, of course, you know, data connectivity. Oops. Uh, we have this eHealth app that have uh, it is like a personal electronic health record uh, that have private and also public. Uh, we, we hope that it can be used in more places like elderly homes, uh, hospital authority, department of health, of course, and the laboratories, uh, district health centers, uh, and so on. It is not happening yet, but then this is our vision. Um, surveillance with all the data being connected, there can always be big data analytics. We can always... Uh, have surveillance on the health of people in each district, and then it can inform intervention, it can inform, you know, care. Uh, and this is really, really exciting. Um, but then because this is also new, uh, the electronic health record is not new, but connecting all the dots are, are actually something uh, yet to be done. 
So what's next? So I, I thought, you know, there are all these things that I think is uh, very, very important. Uh, how to build the system? What are some of the important areas? Uh, the evolving roles and functions. Uh, during my term, I'm only able to put in the hardware, that is the infrastructure of the district health centers. Uh, and everybody is start, just starting. So, you know, what is the meat in it? And, you know, what are some of the programs that should come out with, you know, better health outcomes, more efficient, more effective? Uh, healthcare finances, how are we going to incentivize, for example, family doctors? Uh, is the government going to give additional resources or how can we consolidate the existing resources used in the existing public system so that it can be used more efficiently uh, in the primary care setting? The land resources, now this is very interesting because we think this is going to be a system creation and so uh, the district health centers, most of them are now actually in um, either buildings rented. It is not in government structure, ex except, you know, there are two districts that is in uh, the midst of uh, public housing. So that's why, you know, we have, during my term, have identified in all the 18 districts, a piece of land for the building of this district health center. Uh, but then we thought if we, use this land to build, uh, it would take at least 10 years. So we want this to really, really happen, action-oriented, uh, that it, it can sustain, because each government can change. So, so therefore, we want to make sure, you know, all the land resources are already secured. Um, manpower capacity building, of course. And of course, now that I'm back to the university, being an academic, uh, I feel that, um, and learning from Audrey and your or institute, you know how how we can you know as an academic institution continue to support you know this uh, journey in primary health care. So you know how do we sustain? You know this is just to let you know this is the health bureau, and uh, the Department of Health is government. Hospital authority is government funded. It's all the public hospitals in Hong Kong. So now we have added a primary health commission. Uh, so at least, you know, there are three, you know, so they are responsible for decision making, resource allocation, standard setting, surveillance and health outcome measurement. Uh, then it goes down to the district health centers and also the strategic purchasing office, which coordinates strategic purchasing and also, you know, performance monitoring. Uh, delivery of service is by uh, private uh, primary health care service. Um, you know, the uh, GPs, uh, the NGOs, uh, as well as the primary, uh, public primary health care service. In, in the future, after we have coordinated and also consolidated uh, the, uh, the uh, Department of Health, the hospital authority, primary care uh, services, then it would all, you know, be under one roof, you know, uh, in the district health centers and under the primary health care commission. So uh, the primary care, this is the, the strategic purchasing office where it's pur pur purchase, you know, utilize the market resources, enhance effectiveness, consolidate all the different purchasing and enhance uh, choices. It didn't say resources, but uh, actually the government have previously in two terms of government before put in uh, resources that has not been put into good use. Uh, governance is primary healthcare commission, which again, you know, uh, these are their roles, as I've said earlier. Uh, the evolving functions of the DHC, of course, is very important there in the center. There are family doctors, there are resources, hubs with the partners, chronic disease co-care, the different schemes. So there are lots of meat that uh, can be put in. And, um, you know, I think this is a time for all these to be developed. Healthcare finances, as I've said, you know, earlier, we really want to achieve this desired situation of putting more resources into uh, primary care. Land resources, this is the current map of Hong Kong. Uh, this is the district health centers. Uh, we have seven. Um, the purple one is the district health centers express. Uh, we have 11. And uh, not only, oh, no, only these, but uh, they have satellite centers in this uh, each district. So, for example, uh, Tun Moon is uh, only one center, but they, they have uh, five satellite centers. 
Yunlong is a big piece of land. There is one center, but there are lots of, um, you know, uh, these uh, satellite centers. And the satellite centers are, are you know, are, are developing. Uh, manpower, you know, this is the number of registered healthcare professionals in Hong Kong. Uh, largest is nurses. Uh, we have um, midwives, pharmacists, doctors, uh, dental, uh, dental hygienists, dentists, of course, uh, Chinese medical practitioners. So these are the, the healthcare professionals. So, of course, very important that we need uh, undergraduate, postgraduate, as well as, you know, um, uh, continuing professional, uh, you know, education on all the healthcare professionals in uh, primary healthcare. So finally, the role of uh, academic institutions. I, I, I just want to very quickly introduce, uh, and I have uh, this uh, pamphlets, you know, for, for you um, that I have brought. Um, this is Hong Kong U Primary Healthcare Academy uh, that I have uh, uh, got a donation for me to set up uh, a new initiative uh, this year uh, who actually was you know set up to uh, support and uh, facilitate this journey uh, uh, now that uh, in the role of the academic institution uh, that basically there are four pillars you know the is a platform committed to generating evidence disseminating knowledge uh, incubating next generation of um, healthcare professionals. Um, we want a sustainable system and to address all the health challenges. And of course, we want to really facilitate this new journey of the government. So four pillars, I want to look at these four pillars. Uh, research, education, capacity building. Uh, with the evidence-based practice, we want to have more policy dialogue and policy uh, influence uh, to the government. And finally, uh, international, uh, national, regional, you know, collaboration. So um, these are just the, the different pillars. I, I, I don't want to sort of go through them one by one because I want to leave some time for questions uh, if you have any. So this is the research, the education, uh, the evidence-based uh, services and policy uh, advocacy. You know, I, I just took two pictures of uh, tobacco control advocacy uh, that we have tried to do. This is many years ago. Uh, we tried to get a group of students, uh, and this is our, our dean, you know, at the time. Uh, we actually had this protest um, demonstration to the government, uh, not to, um, again, go against the government, but actually support the government in their tax tobacco tax increase. Because every time, whenever the government increased tobacco tax, there, there must be a lot of uh, different opposition. And uh, the forces is very big. So that's why we, we do a lot to support the government. Uh, and uh, this is, again, to support the banning of e-cigarettes. You know, again, you know, we need all these mass, you know, support to show that uh, actually uh, it is on the people's side and not, you know, only on the legislation. Uh, the legislators and also the tobacco company. Um, international national collaboration. We've started uh, some seminars already. You know, we work with the World Health Organization, uh, and also we we want to really you know sort of work uh, globally um, together with uh, you know the rest of the world to navigate change and also to uh, build a sustainable uh, primary healthcare system. So this is my final slide, um, just some take home messages. Uh, obviously in Hong Kong, if we want to have a sustainable healthcare system, uh, we have started the district health you know, centers as a key infrastructure for delivering uh, primary healthcare. Uh, in addition to the existing primary healthcare services, uh, we have also, also issued a blueprint for sustainable development with all the policy tools. Uh, suggestions uh, is going to, to go on. Um, the healthcare professionals, of course, people is most important. Uh, and um, they play a very, very crucial role. And, you know, they can uh, exercise, you know, their, their role in education, research, practice, uh, knowledge exchange, as well as policy advocacy. Uh, finally, uh, this is a reform. 
and this is the this development of primary health care in Hong Kong actually is a new journey for Hong Kong. Not that it is a new concept, but it is a new journey because uh, never have the government had this big reform. You know, they 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 set up different things, a different policy tools, but this is the first time uh, the whole of government is actually you know put in willing to put in resources and effort to navigate you know this change. So um, I want to do you know some little thing you know now that I'm back to the university uh, to set up have set up this primary healthcare academy. Uh, as a platform to generate evidence and determine the knowledge. This is something that the university do. That's our bread and butter uh, in primary healthcare, as well as um, wanting to incubate this next generation of healthcare professionals in primary healthcare, because uh, this, this education is, uh, and practice is so lacking in our curriculum uh, in the past. So we want to you know, so strengthen that now. Thank you. Uh, and I... Uh, welcome any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for a fascinating uh, and insightful talk. Um, I'm going to turn to the people physically <laughs> present, and then we'll turn to the people that are joining us online for questions. So I see there's a question here. Hi. Hi, uh, hi Professor. Um, it was a really, really interesting talk. Thank you so much for taking us through the steps that I'm uh, again, like Audrey said at the very beginning of the days, by what you were able to achieve in your 10 years in government, and especially as the head, uh, also during COVID. I, <laughs> yes, I half of my time is and, being used to fight COVID. Yeah, and so I, you know, I was taking lots of notes, and I, I hear so much uh, similarities with our system in Canada, and also there's a lot of really interesting differences. Um, I'm actually a PhD student studying health policy at IHP in here, and I study specifically primary care and this idea of task shifting and so who does what and mm -hmm. what is the best composition of teams. Right. So when I heard about what you were talking about in terms of the district health centers, I thought a lot about what Ontario is doing currently mm -hmm. with Ontario health teams. Yeah. But the difference is, you know, the family doctors are already a part of the large teams. Right for the most part, mm -hmm. and also hospitals are a part of that, right? So it's mm -hmm. actually very district-based, and right. um, if patients self-select into uh, an Ontario health team, mm -hmm. so you don't have to live in the area, okay, but you can just choose to get care from a specific center or a specific right. hospital, right? and then that's kind of how you're right past. And so it was, it was kind of interesting. I had a question around when you were in government because I think you showed one of the photos where you were standing beside the Ministry of uh, Minister of Public Relations with it, or and then the Minister yeah. something else. And so I was kind of curious about this kind of intergovernmental relationship building. And a lot of the work that you're doing, it seems like it's not just health focused, mm -hmm. but it would also be social determinants of health, mm -hmm. looking at education, looking at housing. Mm -hmm. And so how did these uh, in Canada, they're called kind of intergovernmental task forces. Mm -hmm. So how did these uh, tables kind of come to be and did you have these types of conversations? And then the other piece is really about the part that you mentioned at the end about having to bring in the family doctors. Could you just speak a bit more about mm -hmm. the composition of uh, family doctors in Hong Kong and, and what it would look like moving forward? Right. Okay. Your first question. Do you want an honest answer? Yeah. <laughs> very difficult. Actually, very difficult yeah. to get uh, people to uh, in different uh, ministry to work together in government. Yeah. It is. It is very very difficult. It's more difficult than the university. I think in wow. the university, <laughs> everybody collaborate. You know, whenever we have something, it's very easy to collaborate. Uh, because uh, each uh, bureau have their own boundaries and also uh, have their own area of work and also priorities. So while the three ministers standing together, <laughs> it doesn't mean <laughs> we actually work very closely together. Um, but of course, leadership is very important. So uh, so uh, given uh, the uh, the leadership, you know, uh, of the government, if they are. Uh, they are the person who can call the shots to have the different bureaus work together. So, um, so, so actually, um, 
I think there are issues that lends itself to require uh, cooperation uh, and collaboration. And COVID is actually one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, the scale of how we can fight COVID is never uh, the work of one bureau. Is is it, it can be? So for primary healthcare, uh, actually. Um, we, uh, in my committee, steering committee, uh, we have people from the Education Bureau, we have people from the Health and Welfare Bureau, um, uh, uh, not, not Health and Welfare now, it's called Labour and Welfare Bureau, so, so that they are aware, you know, number one, they are aware of the policy that we're pushing forward, and second, where there are areas that uh, we, we think it can be, um, can be, uh, can be cooperated, that, um, that we, we can work together. So uh, there is not a lot of uh, real uh, work in terms of collaboration, but at least, you know, the committee uh, has different uh, participation so that everybody is aware, you know, of the policy of another bureau. So, so you know, during, during the time, um, uh, it, it is not easy uh, because everybody have their own priorities and, and the work of you know taking forward priorities uh, may not if if they if they are collaborating with other bureaus all the time then that would dilute their own priorities and I can certainly you know understand that uh, so uh, it it requires leadership. The second question is about a family doctor. I think they are a very important part of uh, you know uh, the primary health care delivery. Uh, when we was first conceptualized, uh, we did a lot of consultation, you know, uh, in different professions. And because in Hong Kong, 70% uh, of the primary care was delivered by private practitioners. So we don't have insurance, it's out of pocket. So they see the development of primary health care by the government a threat to their finances. Because, you know, for them, it's like a business. Um, so, they actually quite object to the fact to object. They they actually uh, object that this district health center should have any doctor in it because they they felt that if there was a doctor there, then a lot of people would go to the district health center like a clinic, and so therefore they won't go to see the private you know doctors. So then, so the seventy percent are doctors. Seventy percent. 70% of primary care delivery uh, are in the private sector. Right, but are those all doctors or are they actually teams or are they? It's more doctors. There are a lot of singleton doctors. Um, yeah, there, there are, of course, HMOs, but uh, the singleton doctors are a lot. Uh, and so the way to do it is that uh, we have district health centers and then we have network you know, uh, GPs. So uh, the government uh, would contact all the uh, GPs in the um, in the district who are private GPs and ask if they are willing to join as a network doctor. And of course, we have all these uh, different requirements and they are to sign and the government would actually subsidize people to go to see them. Um, but it's actually not a lot of interest to tell you the truth because, you know, it. They are they, even without you know sort of joining the government as a network doctor. They actually have a lot of business already. You know why would they do that? So this in how to incentivize the private doctors is something that is that that is a a question for Hong Kong. Probably not in Canada because we already have a. Well, system. We had the the history of it is that the government first covered. Um, hospitals because in those days your biggest financial expense that could ruin you, a, a household or yeah, an individual thanks. is that you needed to be in the hospital yeah and so that was the priority was covering the tertiary care because that's you need a surgery you need something big expensive right um and then to bring the doctors on they posed it here as well because they were being paid out of pocket and by private insurance Mm. And so then we used to have what was called Blue Cross Blue Shield, mm -hmm. uh, which was, you know, basically the provincial governments overtook those private providers. Mm. And that's what became the guts of the uh, covering primary care. But the way they brought the doctors is they made the fees comparable 
to what they were getting mm -hmm. under the private to entice them to come in. Mm -hmm. So Canadian physicians are no more altruistic than any others anywhere else in the world. We had to buy them by, by going with the pre prevailing sort of compensation rates that were existing at the time that most Canadians, and most Canadians were covered. Uh, they were just covered through this uh, not-for-profit private um, schemes. Right, and it's not impossible for Canadian doctors to work privately, but they just can't work both public and privately. And so usually doctors or doctors often work in the public system. Yeah, I think this 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 is a very good question, and we continue to uh, work on this this question. So during my term, we managed to get uh, the DHC to be a coordinator. So they are responsible for getting a group of uh, network doctors, uh, you know, on site so that uh, when they do the screening, if there is anything uh, that is initially screened by the nurse that uh, need confirmation of diagnosis, they send them to the uh, GPs, the network GPs, and then the government would subsidize uh, two visits uh, and you know, for blood taking, for confirmation and diagnosis. And now the government, this term of government is uh, taking forward what they care, what they call the cold care scheme. So again, this is another in, uh, way of uh, incentivizing uh, and paying actually uh, the private uh, family physicians so that they would continue their care because we do not want uh, any people who have a new, new, newly developed disease or anything that we have identified in a community to again go back to our hospital authority system because they already have a long, long waiting time. So we want them to actually stay in the private. But then why would people stay in the private if they have to, you know, pay out of pocket? And yet if they go to the hospital authority, you know, they, they just pay peanuts. So that's why the government is trying, you know, very, very hard uh, uh, to have uh, a family doctor for each and every one of us. But then without an insurance system, this is, this is going to be very difficult. So, so I understand this term of government is, is, is taking this uh, question, you know, forward and finding ways uh, to, to do that. Any questions uh, from our folks online? Can we just see the rest of uh, Elizabeth's uh, comment there. <laughs> okay, no question, but thank you very much for this interesting, I'm gonna assume talk. <laughs> Presentation as a clinical pharmacist in Canada. I'm glad to see integration of pharmacists. Uh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. Yeah, we've certainly learned how valuable uh, pharmacists are through through COVID, um, and they their scope is 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 only growing in primary care here. So it's nice to see. Uh, any other questions uh, from the room? Okay, we'll go Quan and then so just a here. general, really quick question: um, Do we have some early evidence on the effectiveness of these H, uh, DHC centers? Um, what what is in general the ad take? um of these services okay uh good question uh it it is like a um uh, at least initially a membership system so people join as member uh free of charge uh and as i've said the scope of service is primary secondary and tertiary prevention so if you participate in the primary if you're a member uh so you can join uh, each of the 18 districts at a district where you work or live. So um, after you join as a member, then you can participate in the activities. Uh, you can, you know, get the services. Uh, and for the primary prevention services, which are mostly health promotion, have education classes, is all free of charge. Uh, for secondary um, prevention, screening is also free of charge. But if you are screened to have hypertension, or diabetes, then you are sent to a network doctor, and then the government would subsidize two visits um, for you to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, but the assessment is uh, free of charge. Tertiary prevention, uh, 
for example, we work with the hospital authority for them to actually uh, refer cases, you know, to us. For example, people who are uh, under cardiac rehabilitation, people who are um, cancer survivors. So if they want some care from all these registered healthcare professionals from the district health center, they pay a fee. Uh, but this fee is cheaper than the private, but a little bit more than the public uh, you know, system. For example, if they want to have physiotherapy sessions, uh, they they um, they can pay you know a, a fee which is a lot. For example, one hundred and fifty dollars Hong Kong uh, for a session, but in a private you pay eight hundred dollars. You know, something like that. In the public system, you pay sixty dollars. You know, so so that is a little bit like this. Um, so that that's that how how it works. Uh, I don't have figures about uh, uptake. Um, I think during COVID time, it's not so good um, for obvious reasons. Uh, but I think now uh, I I I heard you know there is waiting time <laughs> as well because of the uh, assessment. The assessment it, it it takes a while. Yeah. Thank you. We have question. Our last question, I think. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, my name is Derek. I'm in translation and research. Uh -huh. I think we had an interesting, interesting discussion about how we integrate key stakeholders in with the discussion about positions. I was wondering if there are any groups that were challenging to bring on board, and how did you address those groups to make sure that they didn't have any downside? You mean a group from the uh, community? Yeah, community, community. Uh, and and. The... I don't quite understand your question. Can you can you say again? So I suppose for the physicians, right? Mm -hmm. Since many of them are private, mm -hmm. uh, it'd be better for them to continue the current system before integrating that uh, district healthcare uh, center. Right. Were there any groups like that where they would have some downside mm -hmm. where you were able to address their concerns? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... I th I think there are more groups that have upside more than downside probably. Uh, for example, in the community, because we uh, this district health center, in addition to providing services, they also have a uh, a role as a health hub. So they they actually have to engage uh, the different organizations that is healthcare related in the community and in the district. So, for example, they should be working with uh, NGOs that have um, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, women groups, you know, things like that, uh, so that they can actually, you know, um, extend their, uh, their services or even publicize their service because it's something new in Hong Kong anyway, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the community uh, sort of uh, key stakeholders. So, so these are more upside. Uh, downside, um, actually for the physicians, it's not so much downside, it's just that they don't really care. <laughs> they don't really care because, because it, <laughs> as if it, there is no, nothing uh, to do with them because they can continue to do their own business. Uh, but I'm sure, you know, with this cold care scheme that the government is uh, rolling out, which we do not have the details right now, because I think it will uh, roll out uh, very, very soon, um, that uh, that uh, they would they would uh, that they, there must be a way in incentivizing more of the private GPs. Uh, other groups, uh, I think right now, the. Um, there are two groups that one is very active, the pharmacists just now, you know, they said, uh, because in Hong Kong, in a private um, GPs, they actually also uh, administer drugs, you know, in the in the doctor's office. So uh, as if the, the pharmacists have no role. So that has always been the case. Uh, this is something um, that the pharmacists would like to change. And this is something that I fully support. So now there is a, a lot of a community uh, pharmacist um, uh, work that is uh, 
ongoing. So we have a working group, you know, in the uh, in the government already, uh, sort of discussing how best to roll roll out this. So so this is one group. Uh, another group that is again not so active is the Chinese medicine uh, practitioners. You know, in Hong Kong, actually many people use Chinese medicine, and a lot of them are for preventive care as well. But again, you know, it seems that I have Chinese medical practitioners in my steering committee, but they are not very active. So, um, so we, again, we need to find a way, you know, to see how best to engage them, because again, you know, they are, a, I think they have a key role in delivering primary care as well. And it, it's just that how, how you work everybody together. Yeah, it sounds very familiar. Um, <laughs> despite the fact that we've got everything public, we have not solved these problems, just making everything public. So um, I want to thank you again uh, for just a fantastic talk. And uh, thank you for all the work you've done. That's very, very inspiring uh, to all of us. And so I thank you very much for sharing uh, your time with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.